Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson from Four Corners of the Board, and today I'm going to be looking at Coma Ward. Now my good friend Dean told me about this game after he had kickstarted it. He told me it was a cross between Betrayal at House on the Hill and a horror game I quite enjoy called Lobotomy, so he knew it would pique my interest. Now I really enjoy horror games, and my group has always enjoyed Betrayal, so I knew I had to purchase this game as soon as it hit the retail shelves. Now the game takes place over two halves. The first half, you wake up in a hospital with only your fellow patients. You go around the hospital looking in rooms and finding equipment and clues as to what happened. When you've gathered enough clues, the second half of the game starts, and this is the phenomenon part, where the goal of the game becomes clear and will be based on the order you found the three out of four clues. Now, it sounds like a game that should fit me and my group perfectly. So did it live up to my expectations? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, then I'll come back for my final thoughts on Como Ward. Before I start, I must say that this rules explanation is based on the rules that came in the retail box, the errata that was included in the retail box, plus the updated rule set on the board game Geek. And after all that, this is my group's interpretation of the rule set. Also, I should mention that since this is an experience game with narrative, I'm really going to try hard not to give any spoilers away while going through the rules. I also want to say that the board is set up, but I'm only showing half the board just because of the width of it. Now, after all that, here is Como Ward set up on the table. There is a deck of room tiles, room effect cards, hallucination cards, hallucination room tiles, hallucination room effect cards. The item card deck will have four clue cards that look like this, shuffled in to the top 15 cards of the deck. Each player has a board of their chosen color and their standee which is placed on the second four nurse's station. Players will also receive pill markers of their color and a health slider and terror slider. These sliders are used to keep track of your stats. Players start with 5 health and the matching stats, and 4 focus and the matching terror. When you gain or lose a stat, you move the appropriate slider. Each player is also given a random neurosis chip, which should be placed with the neurosis side up, and players should not look at the other side. Each player is also given a quirk card, which is to be kept secret and only revealed when the phenomenon starts. These quirk cards will add another layer to the game as they require you to watch the other players. Let's have a quick look at the quirk card, and I have hidden some of the information as not to spoil anything. The quirk card will tell you when to place a pill counter on the card. The score and the special ability are not active until the phenomenon starts. Whenever the phenomenon is triggered, anybody with five or more pill counters on their quirk card will get what was written on the card, and the card is now active. If you don't get five pills, the card is discarded. Now there are other components such as rummage tokens, portal tokens, monster tokens, and dice. Let's have a quick look at your player board. First you have health. If you ever got down to zero health, you're dead. Strength and dexterity is tied to your health and are used in skill checks. Strength usually for attack rolls and determine how many items you can carry. Dexterity is also used for dodge checks and determines how many spaces you can move when you take the move action. Terror determines how crippled with fear you are, and the higher the terror, the more neurosis strips you can access. Focus is used in skill checks, usually involving either entering rooms or rummaging for an item in a room. Now let's quickly talk about the neurosis strips. On the front side there are three sections, and these neurosis strips line up with your player board. Wherever your terror marker is, is the extra abilities that your neurosis strip gives you. The neurosis strip will also tell you when you can flip your neurosis over to the P neurosis side. Note though that once it's flipped to the P side, it can never be flipped back. So let's get back to the gameplay. In player order, each player will do the following. Take any number of free actions once, take exactly one main action, Resolve any end of turn effects from rooms, items, or conditions that they have. And finally, check your neurosis strip. The free actions you can take on your turn are move, trade, use a carried item, or drop items in your space. Each action can only be done once per turn. To move, players can move their standing up to the current dexterity. When moving, you can freely move into and out of spaces with other players, go between floors using the stairs, where each floor takes one movement point, or attempt to use the elevator, which will take one movement point. If you want to use the elevator, you must roll a die, and on a 1, the elevator does not show up, and one of your movement points is wasted. Otherwise, if the elevator does show up, you can go to any floor. If you enter a grey room, your movement will automatically end. It should be noted that the hallway on each floor counts as one space, so going from one room to another room on the same floor will only cost you two movement, because you go from room to hall back to a room. Another free action is to trade with willing players in the same space as you. You can trade, 
receive, or give as many items as you wish as long as at the end of the trade each player respects their carrying limit. If you have an item, as a free action you can use it, or you could drop it. Now let's have a quick look at the item cards. They're going to have a title on them that tells you what they are, weapon, food, medicine, or clothing. The card will also tell you how to use it and what effects happen when you use it. And I'll get into weapon cards a little later when I talk about combat. So those are the free actions you can take. Let's talk about your main action. You are required to take one main action on your turn. They include revealing a new room tile, rummaging on a revealed tile, attack or steal from another player or enemy, or pick up any dropped items in a room. When you reveal a room tile, you'll flip it over, and if there's a number on it, you'll draw the room effect card. If it has a when revealed action on it, you're going to do it now. Then you must do a focus check. That is a roll the number of dice equal to your current focus. So now as a quick aside, when doing any skill check, including a focus check, you're going to roll the number of dice equal to your skill. Any fives and sixes are successes, and one, two, or three are failures. But a four is what's called suspense. You will reroll all fours plus one extra die for each four. Repeat until all dice are either failures or successes. Then you count up how many successes you have. So let's get back to the room tile. You need three or more successes on your focus check. If you get three or more, you'll draw an item card. If you fail, the person to your left draws a hallucination card and reads the title and gives you options. You'll pick one of the options and then the card will be resolved. If you're still in the room after the focus check, and there is a when you end your movement here action for the room, you can apply it now. Now once a room tile has been revealed, another main action you can do is rummage in it to find items. You will do a focus check, just like revealing a room tile, and if you fail, hallucination card happens, if you succeed, you get an item card. If you get an item due to a successful rummage, put a rummage token on the room. It can no longer be rummaged by anybody. Another main action you can do is pick up any item that was dropped by another player. The last main action is attacking or stealing another player, and this is going to be used both in the main part of the game and after the phenomenon happens. The attacker will pick a weapon and do a skill check based on the weapon plus whatever bonuses the weapon gives you. If we look at a weapon card, it will tell you which skill is going to be used and what the bonus is. You're going to do a skill check based on that plus the bonuses and count up your successes. The defender will now decide whether they want to dodge or counterattack. If they dodge, they will do a skill check on their dexterity, plus two. If they counterattack, they'll pick a weapon and roll the appropriate skill checks, plus the bonuses. Now, instead of going through all the permutations of attack, steal, dodge, counterattack individually, here's a quick chart found in the rulebook that kind of explains what happens when. That wraps up the main actions you can do on your turn. The point of the first half of the game is to be revealing room tiles, looking for clues, and stocking up on items. When you discover a clue card, you'll place it aside with a next number in sequence. When there are three clues found, a phenomenon happens. When a phenomenon happens, each player will reveal their quirk cards. If they got five or more tokens on it, they will receive the benefit for the rest of the game. Otherwise, they are discarded. Then, depending on the order of the three revealed clues, you'll open the appropriate phenomenon box, as shown in this chart here. The box will have instructions and any components required for the phenomenon. The instructions will also tell you how to finish the game. Now the game will continue with standard turn structures until the phenomenon end conditions are met. I can't really say much more about the game, but that gives you a general overview of how this whole game plays. So with that, let's get back to see what I thought about Como Ward. So let's talk about theme and components. First off, I really did like the theme. The idea that you wake up and you and your fellow patients have to walk around with no memories searching for rooms for what happened is a fantastic theme. The components are, well, they're underwhelming in my opinion. Now, one thing I didn't show during the walkthrough is that the game board is actually two sides. Uh, you have the side that I sh showed you in the walkthrough and then you kind of have uh, this side as well. Uh, it's kind of more of a hand-drawn uh, art. The components themselves really felt uh, kind of cheap and lacking design on them. Now, from reading the rule book, in fact, that was intentional. Now, why do all the standees kind of look the same? Uh, because of theme. Hmm. Okay. But there are many other design choices I didn't understand. Why do the room tiles not have text on them? I believe that they did it so they don't obscure the art. But honestly, the art on the room tiles is not that interesting. It's generic. And having these cards beside it all the time really became cumbersome. And why not include enough tokens to cover the base game cards? For example, you can find portals on at least two different cards, but they only give you one set of, of portal tokens. So when the second portal comes up, what do you do? Now, luckily, when I punch my game, 
I kept these little pieces that came off the sliders. I'd never thought I'd have to use what I would consider throwaway to mark things on the game board. I, I just don't understand. And let's talk about the rules. Now, some of the rules are straightforward, and the rulebook does give you a good job of telling you the basics of the game. The rules for how to reveal a room tile are not well written. For a game that is so simple, the rules should not be this difficult. And the fact there isn't an errata in the box, I can't decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Now, unfortunately, the rules that come with each phenomenon box are not much better. They give you some background as to what's happening and what you have to do, but again, the rules leave it open to too much of the, oh, but what happens here? And that's one of my biggest problems with the game. The FAQ refers to these uh, situations as edge cases. And I'm normally okay with that, as it would be almost impossible to design a game like this for this many players and try out every single combination. But you know what? When it happens every single time I play, and my group has to make up rules for situations, it just doesn't sit well for me. But Graham, I hear you say, this is an experience game. It's supposed to be fun, and if you get into the characters and go with the flow, you'll just enjoy it that way. You shouldn't be so concerned about the rules. So let's talk about the gameplay itself. First off, I want to say that I do enjoy Betrayal of the Hill. I do like this style of game. And I can happily live with sometimes the clutchy scenarios as the people I play with try to get into characters and play it up. Especially in Betrayal at the beginning when all you're doing is exploring. But at least in Betrayal you have something to base your character on, to how you're playing it up. You're either a plucky, annoying young kid, the grumpy old grandpa, the jock, etc. It's all based on the little characters that you have. In this game, you're just nameless, faceless patients, and it gives you very little to build upon. You know what? And it makes it very difficult to get into the game, to have an experience. And what you do in your turn is essentially move and reveal a tile or rummage a previously revealed tile, which involves rolling dice. Okay, you know what? That is actually a slightly interesting mechanism, where the fours allow you to re-roll some of the dice. I like the mechanism, but all too often we were failing our rolls and having to draw hallucination cards. Great, hallucination cards. That's something interesting, right? Well, no. There are a couple copies of the same card in the deck. You can have two or three that start off exactly the same line and options. Now, the cards are not identical. The header and choices are identical, but the outcomes are not. But some of the duplicated cards just have the outcomes move around. I was hoping that these, key, these cards would be fun, but honestly, they just kind of turned out flat. Another thing that annoyed me was the combination of clues not complete unless you have the expansion of Kickstarter version. The very first game we played, the order the clues came out was not a phenomenon we had in the box. So the rules say, just pick one that you want to play. Because honestly, the clues don't matter. When you open up the phenomenon, it will tell you what the clues represent. But even that's not consistent. You'll find, for example, clues A, B, and C in that order, and open up the phenomenon box that goes with A, B, and C in that order. And it will say, well, clue D represented this. Clue A was this, and clue B was this. But you know what? I never found clue D. Now, you know what? I know I'm being hard on this game. And if this was a fun or interesting game, I could look over all these little things. But when it gets right down to it, nobody I played this game with had fun. And it's just these little things I've brought up. It's the game itself. For us, at least, just wasn't fun to play or to experience. There wasn't enough to draw you into the game, into what you were doing. When the phenomenon started, there was a bit more to bring you in. But honestly, it was too little, too late. Now, just about everybody I played with enjoyed the premise and theme of the game, but nobody enjoyed themselves playing it. So with that, I would have to say this game I would not recommend. And that, unfortunately, is it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.